This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. So please take a seat. Uh, we're going to start uh, the second half of today's uh, uh, conference. Um, every year we are going to have a debate. And uh, this, is, uh, this particular debate is uh, you know, highly controversial. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, alcoholic liver disease, whether we keep or change the six month rule is sometimes not up to the liver transplant program. And there's been a lot of debate back and forth about uh, this particular issue. And so I think that it's, uh, it's gonna be a lot of fun to uh, you know, talk about this, address some of the key issues. And uh, I'm pretty sure that it would generate a lot of discussions from the audience. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce our two presenters. Uh, first, uh, Monica Saka. Monica uh, Saka has been a wonderful addition to UCSF Hepatology since two years ago. And uh, she has been really active in both research and clinical activities in viral hepatitis, as well as fatty liver disease. And I think that uh, her greatest passion is really women's health and liver disease. And uh, she is a recipient of the Career Development Award for ASLD. And I know that she's so excited. She wants to win uh, this particular debate. And she's up against a very tough opponent, uh, Andrew Paso, who's a really talented multi-organ surgeon, a transplant surgeon, and also the co-director of the bariatric surgery program at UCSF. I want to recognize Andy for his contribution in really doing a lot of research and background check and you know, review you know, the evidence so that we come up with the screening using ethyl glucuronide and ethyl sulfate. So uh, without further ado, I was asked to present a case. I've never looked at it before. So, so if I stumble a little bit, uh, forgive me about that. So it's a case, OK? So you know, it's the background for the debate. There's a 45-year-old man with known alcoholic cirrhosis. He's a partner in a reputable consulting firm. Four and a half months ago, admitted with ascites and first decompensation, and served as wake up call and no alcohol since. He now participate in an alcohol rehabilitation program several times a week, no desire to drink, at least by his report. Excellent social support, married, and has teenage kids. Father was an alcoholic. Mel is 28. Should we list this patient? Okay. Should I go to the second case too? Okay. What if this is a 45 year old man, no known alcoholic liver disease? He's a partner in a reputable consulting firm. Can I, may I know what firm this is? No. <laughs> Okay, drinks three to four glasses of wine and or liquor most days in the context of dinner meetings. Often drink more on the weekends when hosting social events for clients. Uh, admitted with alcoholic hepatitis, male of 36, non-responsive to steroids. Uh, his alcohol consumption is similar to his peers and colleagues. He has never considered himself to be an alcoholic. Excellent social support, Mary, and has teenage kids. No family history of alcoholism. Should we list this patient? So maybe before I hear the debate, should I ask a show of hands? No? Yeah, OK. So let's do the first case. Uh, no, let me do. Should we list the first patient? How many would say yes? Okay, and how many would say no? Okay. I'm always neutral in this debate. 
<laughs> and uh, so the next case, um, should we list this patient? How many of you, uh, get a show of hands, would say yes? And how many would say no? And I abstain again. So, um, so Monica will start first. So thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, and I'm quite happy to be taking the side of defending the six-month rule prior to listing patients for liver transplant with alcoholic liver disease. So in 2014, there were just over 6,000 transplants for adults in the United States, and about 20% of those are for patients with alcoholic liver disease. Anywhere from 20 to 45% of patients are gonna have some de degree of drinking after transplant. Usually we quote about 20 to 25%, with some studies noting higher rates of around 45. Among all of those patients who have some degree of recidivism after transplant, half are gonna start binge drinking or having heavy use. So the goal of having a, requ a required length of sobriety is really to try to decrease our risk of recidivism, and then to decrease the risk of potentially associated graft loss. But the question is, does this actually work? So we've known for quite some time that less than six months of length of pre-transplant sobriety is actually associated with an increased risk of post-transplant recidivism. And so these are the data, early data out of UCSF that found that those patients that had six months or less of a duration of pre-transplant sobriety had a relative risk that was seven times higher for post-transplant drinking compared to patients who had more than six months of sustained sobriety. And we've actually been able to see this very strong association in many uh, recent studies. So here I've, I've highlighted all studies that have been reported just within the past 10 years, showing a very strong and independent predictive value of length of pre-transplant sobriety on your risk of post-transplant recidivism. And then highlighting just a few studies that have specifically shown the predictive value of the six-month cutoff. And as you can see in this outcomes columns, it's not just that pre-transplant length of sobriety predicts drinking after transplant, it actually predicts harmful drinking after transplant. So now we'll take a closer look at some of these data. So Dee Martini at a University of Pittsburgh is a, is a particular expert in the area of post-transplant recidivism and predictors of post-transplant drinking. And unlike most of the studies that have been retrospective in nature, she's actually been conducting prospective surveys with patients in the clinic as well as by telephone to find out about post-transplant drinking patterns and predictors of post-transplant drinking overall. So unlike the 20 to 25% that we typically quote for just risk of drinking after transplant, she's found that actually almost 50% of patients are gonna drink after transplant. 20% of all patients transplanted for alcoholic liver disease are actually gonna have problematic heavier binge drinking. And in her study, length of sobriety was the strongest predictor of high risk alcohol use after transplants. So in some of her earlier data, so this is back in 2006, she showed that each additional month of sobriety decreased your risk of post-transplant recidivism by about 35%. And in addition to the protective value of increasing length of sobriety, some poor prognostic factors included a dependence history, history of depressive disorder. Now these are some Canadian data, um, patient, about 170 patients that were transplanted for alcoholic liver disease. And as you can see, the relative risk of any drinking after transplant was actually highest among patients that had six months or, or less of a pre-transplant sobriety period. And this just, let me take a, no, let's see if this pointer is. Yeah, it's actually, this doesn't seem to be working. Perfect, thanks. So as you can see, there's this, the highest relative risk of drinking after transplant for these short sobriety periods, which just steadily declines the longer the patients are away from alcohol. Now these results are actually more striking when you look at problem drinking. So the relative risk of problem drinking after transplant is 8.5 for patients with six months or less of a pre-transplant sobriety period, and then drops precipitously thereafter. <clears throat> 
So these same authors have a really lovely figure. So on the x-axis, you can see months of pre-transplant abstinence. And on the y-axis, you see different patterns of drinking. So we're patients who have no drinking after transplant, mild drinkers early on, mild drinkers later on, problematic drinkers early on, and then problematic drinkers more than 12 months after transplant. And each circle represents an individual patient. So certainly if you set your threshold to about 18 months, you're gonna get rid of lots of these problematic drinkers who won't end up going on to transplant. But the problem is you're gonna exclude a lot of people who have no issues with drinking in the post-transplant period. Now there are fewer patients at that six month threshold and a few of these stragglers that sneak in there. And all of us have had that experience of patients who have made it to that six months and post-transplant begin drinking and begin drinking heavily. So why is that? Well, it's not just length of sobriety that's gonna predict your risk of post-transplant um, recidivism. In fact, there's additional psychosocial factors that are very strongly associated with risk of any drinking and risk of harmful drinking. So this was a meta-analysis that was also published by Demartini's group. And they were looking at a slew of psychosocial factors that might be associated with post-transplant recidivism. In any of the squares to the right of zero over here, show factors that are associated in some, to some degree with post-transplant recidivism, and I've specifically circled the ones that were statistically significant based on this meta-analysis. But as you can see, patients who are unmarried, um, actually even studies that haven't just looked at marriage, but do you have a life partner strongly associated with heavy drinking after transplant, poor social support, Pre-transplant psychiatric history um, is underwhelming here in the study, but they lumped everybody. So even people who had mild situational anxiety, for example. But when you look at patients who are bipolar, have poorly controlled psychiatric disease, they have a high risk of post-transplant recidivism. Family history, so primary first degree relative who's an alcoholic, strongly associated with post-transplant drinking, and as I've argued today, um, and so is length, pre-transplant length of abstinence of less than or equal to six months. So we spend all of this time discussing these pre-transplant factors that are associated with post-transplant recidivism, and particularly the six month rule. But does drinking after transplant actually affect your outcomes? Meaning, do you have increased graft loss or do you have a decreased risk and survival? Well, there's some studies that will say no. And I caution you when you're looking at these data to look at the type of drinking that patients are, that these studies are talking about post-transplant. Are they talking about patients who are drinking any degree of alcohol in the post-transplant period or talking about patients who really have heavy problematic drinking? So this was a study by Quadrata that was published in Liver Transplant in 2005, a retrospective Spanish study looking at 54 patients who were transplanted with alcoholic liver disease, and they were assessing um, the patient's survival. And they found that recidivism was associated with an increased risk of post-transplant death with a hazard ratio of 5.7. And then when you look at patients with heavy drinking, this they defined as um, persistent use of 30 grams a day or just almost three glasses a day compared to patients who had um, occasional drink or no alcohol. Those who had recidivism, heavy recidivism, had a much worse survival compared to those that did not. Now these are data from more recently published in 2013 from the United States. So 300 transplant recipients for alcoholic liver disease, and they found that alcohol use post-transplant was associated with advanced fibrosis, so an adjusted odds ratio of 23. And as you can see here, actually the y-axis is the proportion that are free of graft loss. So there's more graft loss in patients who are continuing to have heavy alcohol use compared to those who are your intermittent occasional drinkers, including those who actually have no alcohol after transplant. So you can still see that drinking, you know, having a pre-transplant sobriety period of less than six months is certainly associated with any drinking. It's definitely associated with harmful drinking, and we know harmful drinking is bad. You're going to have increased risk of losing your graft, and you're going to have decreased post-transplant survival. But there's other kind of common sense reasons why you might want to wait. So there's longer observation periods that really allow you to watch for time for relapse. So you're kind of road testing patients, particularly some of your high-risk patients. And we know that rehab, relapse after you've attended rehab is associated with drinking after transplant. You also have the ability to assess for compliance with rehab, as attendance in rehab is also associated with a decreased risk of post-transplant recidivism. And then there's time for liver recovery. 
And some patients with ongoing links to sobriety can have improvement in their liver function and may even be able to avoid need for liver transplant. So what about the patients who don't have time to wait? So particularly the patients with severe alcoholic hepatitis. Now most of you are probably familiar with this landmark publication from the New England Journal in 2011. So this was a French study that was looking at comparing survival in patients who underwent early liver transplant for severe ALK-HEP. This is patients with high discriminant function, LEAL score greater than 0.45, non-responsive to treatment. And as you can see here, Survival at six months was about 77%, 71% at two years, compared to 23% for the patients who did not undergo liver transplant. Not surprising, if you take people who are on the brink of death and give them the only curative option, then they're gonna do better than patients who go on to die. But what's striking about this finding is that the six month and the 20 month survival are actually lower than what we'd like to see. So at UCSF, for example, our one year survival is 93%. So having a six month survival of 77% might not be good enough. And they'll argue, these authors, and perhaps Dr. Possel, that they only used about 2% of their donors. But you have to realize that this is in a low meld region. And with a median meld score of liver transplant at UCSF of 35, we don't have the luxury of being able to utilize donors, the, you know, the small donor pool that we already have, when, our, when many of our patients with high meld scores, decompensated alcoholics, cirrhotics, who have excellent predictive factors, um, factors associated with decreased risk of recidivism, aren't making it to liver transplants. And then importantly in the study, they had very stringent inclusion criteria for who would actually be considered for liver transplant. Patients couldn't have any comorbidities, no concern for addiction, so they've never been told not to drink or ever had it brought to any medical attention that they had an issue with alcoholism, no prior ALK-HEP, obviously, and they had a very favorable psychosocial eval. So that resulted in less than 2% of all patients being evaluated that were considered for liver transplantation. So I liken this to Where's Waldo? So you could imagine we're opening up the floodgates, the number needed to evaluate to identify that one patient who could be Waldo is very large. And we don't know if we can really handle the, both the burden on the transplant center, in particular at times in areas with, with scarce donor availability, um, as well as the resource that it's gonna be on our, for psychosocial evaluations. And there's additional concerns with alcoholic hepatitis. So in the Matherin study, none of the patients relapsed by six months, but three of 13 patients that had available follow-up by two years start, started to drink again, so about 25%, two with heavy use. And that was in France, and we have to really be cognizant of cultural differences in alcohol use. Um, a lot of times in Europe, drinking is common, Drinking happens socially and really on a regular basis. In the United States, to be frank, people love to get drunk and they love to go out and binge drink. So when you're understanding the cultural context, it's hard to be very generalizable when you're looking at studies that are published in European data and extrapolating that to say that's how our patients in the United States are gonna behave. And four out of six of these deaths were actually due to aspergillus. So we also need to be very cognizant of the potential increased infection risk for these patients that are exposed to longer durations of corticosteroid in the pre-transplant period. Now I will share with you some preliminary data on early liver transplant in the US experience. And these are some data from the Sinai group. So they have evaluated 111 patients with severe ALK-HEP um, showing a bit more favorable um, post-transplant survival, 89% at six months, 12 months, compared to 11%. Uh, but again, this is based on numbers of eight patients at six months and six patients at 12 months. And of the patients that they evaluated, nine of them had favorable, favorable enough psychosocial profiles and subsequently underwent liver transplant evaluation. So among, or excuse me, underwent liver transplantation. Among the eight patients that were alive at two years, two relapsed, one with graft dysfunction. And then one patient that died early on actually had very severe necrotizing pancreatitis in the setting of their alcohol use. And I lifted this sentence from their discussion section because I thought it was very telling um, where, where Jean M, the, the first author on this publication said, this process was time consuming for the addiction team. So in summary, not all 
post-transplant drinking may be bad. And probably the occasional intermittent drink after transplant is not gonna affect your survival or graft loss. But harmful drinking is harmful, and it's certainly associated with increased graft loss and decreased survival. And the six-month rule not only predicts any drinking after transplant, it predicts harmful drinking. The six-month rule allows time for a relapse or for road testing of these high-risk patients, and also allows for rehab, which is protective against post-transplant drinking. And with ongoing sobriety, some patients may be able to avoid liver transplant. Now, there are certainly other factors that predict post-transplant recidivism, some psychiatric fa factors, family history of alcoholism, social support. And it's not to say that we should identify the patients who have a family history of alcoholism and preclude them from liver transplant, but more that we should start identifying the constellation of factors um, that make up a patient who's at high risk for recidivism and do more on the post-transplant post management, including requirement of ongoing AA attendance after patients have been transplanted, really optimizing um, management of co -medical, comorbid medical conditions, particularly psychiatric disease, for example. And alcoholic hepatitis is a distinct entity. And it, there's a potentially heavy burden to identify that one rare good candidate who might do well with early transplant. Particularly, again, when we're talking about UCSF with a median MELD score at transplant of 35 um, in an already very constrained deceased donor pool. Now with additional US data, including longer term follow-up, this may help to guide our future directions at UCSF and whether we may ultimately consider doing alcoholic hepatitis, but we're gonna need to see much more favorable outcomes uh, post-transplant for these patients before we would consider doing that at our institution. So for now, the six-month rule is here to stay. Thank you. It was much too long, so I think points off. And also, uh, yeah, from the, from the vote count <laughs> earlier, I guess I'd consider this a, a hostile audience. Um, but it's funny because I have, most of my slides are the same slides as Monica has, and the, most of the uh, references are the same. So I think it shows you a little bit how uh, vague this field is, and um, really, we don't really know what we're doing. So I'll try to kind of give you my take on it and you can think about it while you're having a glass of wine at dinner and see if you really agree with the six month rule. So, uh, you know, my position is that we should, uh, main, we should not keep the six month rule uh, in these patients and I'll talk about the chronic alcoholics first and then the uh, patients with alcoholic hepatitis. And then, how do I go down? Oh, I see, okay. So just a, a brief summary of what the six-month rule is. It's really a, a pre-transplant requirement in most centers at, in the U.S. and actually worldwide. It requires a six-month abstinence with random talk screens and AA attendance. And really, there's no exceptions for anyone. You know, if you have a MELT score of 35 and you come in, you've had, had been drinking recently, you still have to go through this. And the dur duration of six months is really totally arbitrary. It's based on uh, the likelihood of recovery from severe alcoholic hepatitis. And Monica, I think, showed you this uh, paper already from DiMartini. And really, there is data, obviously, there's evidence that shows that duration of abstinence uh, is correlated with less drinking after transplant. But there are many other factors that um, affect this as well, including uh, family history and psychiatric disorders. And also, the, the uh, six months limit is really sort of an arbitrary one. So here's the evidence for the six-month rule. Um, uh, actually, let me tell you first about how they get these results. Most of these studies are retrospective, or there are very few that are prospective, uh, since most studies don't have enough patients with six, less than six months sobriety, since most centers transplant these. The associations are weak. If you look at the graph at the bottom here, this is an area, this is a ROC curve, and you can see uh, for a good correlation, you have an AOC curve of about 0.9 or so. When you look at the duration of sobriety uh, predicting relapse. So uh, the longer the sobriety, the lower the relapse. You can see that it's really a wash. It's an AUC of 0.6, so it's really uh, not a very good correlation. And you can see that it's not any better uh, when you look down at around the six to nine month level. And again, there's no real cutoff at six to nine months. It's more, more of a uh, continuous uh, range, and if you talk to 
the, the vast majority of addiction specialists, they, they count years of, of sobriety as really the, uh, the most important things that shows the, um, you know, the, uh, the risk of recidivism being low. So it's not, not something in months. And then here's some more uh, evidence. Again, same papers that, that Monica showed, but you can see that you can spin the evidence in a different way. Um, you know, the, there is an association, but there are other things such as family history, social instability, poly substances abuse. When you look at studies that um, sort of lump things together to see whether uh, six months of uh, um, sobriety is predictive, you can see that uh, here only two studies out of, out of 11 found that there was an association, nine others didn't. Uh, when you look at social instability, about six or seven studies found an association, whereas one didn't, and again, family history also. Um, again, there's more of a correlation with more studies showing a correlation uh, and, uh, as, and fewer should not showing a correlation. And then this is the, the study that Monica talked about. Again, there's uh, abstinence certainly does play a role, but other things do as well. And you have to take this... Uh, in the context of how the monitoring was. So, you know, in, in the old days, I don't think there was really any good monitoring. I mean, until about a couple of years ago at UCSF, we used to ask the patient, obviously, and then we would do a blood alcohol level, which is worthless if you're more than 12, months, 12 uh, hours out from your last drink, or we would check the urine, which is also quite insensitive. So we've, we really did not have a good way of predicting who was actually drinking or not. Um, we have better methods now, we use ethyl glucuronide and ethyl sulfate, and also some people recommend hair toxicology, um, and those are better at picking people up. And you know, over and over at our conferences, we are surprised at who is actually positive. And we always say, well, maybe it's the bacteria in the urine or something, but uh, you know, it's surprising how many more people you think than you think are actually drinking. Um, and then the other thing is we don't really know uh, whether these patients post-transplant are being honest. I mean, we, take, we bring them to our clinic, we talk to them, we ask them if they're drinking, uh, encourage them strongly not to, but we really don't have a sort of a, 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 a routine, uh, structured post-transplant follow-up. And I think that's something important that we should work on because I think that will affect recidivism rates also. And now the big question comes whether it really matters if patients drink. Uh, we tell our patients that if you have one drink, your liver will fall apart and you'll die. Uh, pretty much all the time. And uh, when you really look at the data, it's actually very different. This is uh, a study that, again, again uh, Demartini, that looked at, looked at the rates of relapse after transplant. You can see that many patients, almost 50% at uh, four to five years have, had, have drunk again. Uh, some of them binge drink, so about 20 to 30 percent, and then uh, these patients drink all the time. Uh, and this is despite the six-month sobriety level. And when you look at the post-transplant survival, overall in that group, I think, the, as Monica said, the heavy drinkers post-transplant will do worse. But overall, when you look at the, uh, the survival rates and the graft uh, survival rates for these patients, uh, it's about the same as patients who don't drink. Uh, when you look at the risk of graft loss, it's about 2% at 10 years, which is about the same as what it is for PBC. And interestingly, the, the paper that we talked about earlier, Quadrado, uh, that showed higher graft losses in heavy drinkers, when you look at that data, the graft loss was not due to alcoholic liver disease, it was due to cancer and atherosclerotic disease. So you could argue it's associated with, with drinking, smoking, and so forth, but it was not actually due to the uh, alcohol use. So, you know, some of the uh, deleterious consequences of the six-month rule. So patients may not be referred until their disease is advanced, and they can't do rehab, and they can't even get transplanted. Uh, you're imposing this external uh, strict rule on patients, and you may actually be selecting for patients who will go through it because they know they'll get a transplant rather than patients who are self-motivated and try to uh, undergo rehab on their own and really believe that that's the right thing to do. Importantly, you don't differentiate between a slip and a relapse. And again, that gets back to the dinner tonight. So you have a drink of, uh, you know, a glass of wine tonight, and let's say, I understand if you're an alcoholic, you shouldn't do that, but if you slip once, does that really exclude you from having a liver transplant? Is that, is that the death sentence then? Uh, and then finally, there's a lot of stigma att attached to, liver to alcoholic liver disease, uh, and it's really stigmatized already. We're understanding now that it's a disease, it's not a moral defect uh, or, you know, weakness of the spirit. Uh, 
So my recommendation for, at least for the alcoholic cirrhotics, is that until we have better prospective data with accurate pre and post transplant monitoring, we, shouldn't, we should get rid of the six month rule and centers should really develop specific, uh, patient specific and center specific approaches when dealing with these patients. And I think that's what they deserve. Um, now, as far as liver transplants for severe alcoholic hepatitis, again, again I'm in favor. Uh, this is the Mathurin paper, um, and I won't, I won't go through it again uh, because Monica summarized it. Uh, and really, here are some of my sort of criticisms that people have brought up uh, and will bring up, how, I, I assume, and my counterpoints. So really, it's the only published trial, which is true, but it's uh, garnered enough interest that there are, uh, there's a large funded trial ongoing in Europe. And as you heard, we're also trying this out in, uh, in uh, the US um, at the uh, Mount Sinai. There are highly selective inclusion criteria with a complex selection process, uh, very true, and I think this is uh, probably the key point in this whole thing. Um, but I would argue that we can develop, uh, we already have a lot of these processes in place because we do screen every patient very closely. I think we need to work on processes that would allow us to screen patients at outside hospitals so they don't have to all come in before we decide if we're gonna transplant them or not. And I think that's not a very, that's complicated, but I think it's not uh, unreasonable or impossible. We do that for other types of patients. The um, potential to overall uh, program capacity is a point that was brought up by, by John in an editorial uh, who calculated uh, that about 11,000 patients in France over five years would, would potentially be transplantable for um, severe alcoholic hepatitis. And again, I think we need to just figure out ways of screening better outside the transplant center and having the community physicians uh, participate at least in the initial screenings, but I don't think it's not a, it's impossible. And then finally, the argument that organs will be taken away from other critically ill patients. Um, true, uh, this is a disease, so I'm not sure why they would be taking them away from other patients who are also sick. Um, I think the MELD scores, you know, with the MELD score of the share 35, when you look at the MELD scores in the Mathurin study, it was 34. So really, uh, there would be some taking away, but not necessarily. And we know already that there's an inequality with the HCC uh, cohort. I know that there, people are working to try to fix that. But um, there are, this is not a perfect system. Uh, finally, a couple of sort of more moral issues. Uh, many people feel that alcoholic liver disease is self-inflicted, but when you look at the numbers of people who actually develop cirrhosis from alcohol use, it's only about 10 to 15 percent. So there's clearly uh, non-psychological, um, there's the physiological aspects that go into it that don't really, you know, people respond differently to different amounts of alcohol and there's clear cut genetic predisposition. So this is a disease. And people also argue that liver transplant uh, uh, willingness to donate uh, may decrease uh, uh, if patients, if, if families and donor families or the public hears that um, we're transplanting patients with uh, alcoholic liver disease. And I just have, I don't have a lot of data. I actually, I do have one paper that I can show you later, but you know, really there isn't much out there. But uh, one interesting thing that really uh, touched me when I was looking through the data is that how much in the UK, which is quite strict about uh, transplanting for alcoholic liver disease, how, uh, how huge a public outpouring of support there was for this uh, one young patient who was dying of uh, uh, severe alcoholic hepatitis. So there, the newspapers were filled, the media was filled, everyone was uh, really gunning, uh, gunning for this patient. And when you look at countries where um, there are strict criteria and there aren't, there really aren't any good correlations between willingness to donate uh, versus not. So p countries that have very strict alcohol use criteria uh, don't necessarily have uh, better rates of donation or better agreement to donation. And again, and we don't see this with uh, other types of quote unquote self-abusive behaviors like Tylenol overdose or uh, IV drug users who get acute hep B. Um, um, so I think we just need to weigh this uh, sort of in a more uh, balanced light. And then this is a, just a paper that uh, came out recently that looks at uh, uh, public views towards transplanting for alcoholic liver disease. This was an uh, online survey, 500 people. And really the, major the majority were either unsure or agreed with it. So 50% agreed, which is very surprising. I think it's very different from what people expected. And about 40% were unsure. Um, they actually did not feel strongly uh, that uh, against a nearby center performing liver transplant for alcoholic hepatitis. Uh, 
And there were certain other criteria, and it's interesting because the things that they felt important for allowing a transplant for uh, a patient were some of the things that we look at already. So good social support, having financial stability, um, being sort of young, middle age, um, are all things that we consider very important when we evaluate these patients. So that all comes, sort of comes into the fold. And um, finally, that 74% would not hesitate to donate, irrespective of the scenario. So that's, uh, that's quite a majority. So I think the public view of this is changing. And then finally, the ethical considerations. You know, this is not a moral decision that we are to make. And if you look at the UNOS guidelines, they don't, uh, there is no guideline saying you can transplant for alcoholic liver disease even if there's inadequate uh, uh, sobriety because they know that that's not something that they're able to say. And if you look at, you know, these various ethical uh, statements like the Declaration of Istanbul, you know, really organs should be equitably allocated to recipients without regard to gender, ethnicity, uh, religion. Uh, i.e. do not discriminate against patients based on past behaviors unless they have a clear impact on graft outcomes. So one could argue that if you go back to drinking, you could have a, a heavy drinking, you could have a, a clear outcome, but it's, it's really not that, that clear cut. And I don't think you can punish someone uh, for their past behaviors like that when you know that outcomes after transplant are good. I mentioned the, uh, the issue of uh, alcoholism being a disease. Um, and really should be considered in the same way that we consider NASH and obesity uh, as, uh, as uh, problems. And then finally, a Hippocratic Oath of us that, that we take uh, really is do no harm, beneficent autonomy and justice, and really provide therapy according to the best scientific knowledge that we have. And for us, we do have good knowledge that shows that liver transplantation for alcoholic liver disease is of benefit to the patient. So just uh, summarizing, I think we do have specific criteria for identifying patients who could benefit with alcoholic liver disease, uh, uh, sorry, uh, severe alcoholic hepatitis and who will not respond to conventional therapy. There's clearly a survival benefit in this group. The risk of recidivism is low. Uh, the public opinion is changing and we do have ethical uh, obligations to, uh, to uh, allow equitable distribution of organs. So I believe that centers should permit liver transplant for select patients with uh, severe alcoholic hepatitis, and there should be uh, multidisciplinary clearing protocols to identify patients suitable for transfer, and then um, these must be developed in, a, in conjunction with the uh, community. Thank you. I think that both of you have done a beautiful job in this debate, and I agree with both of you. <laughs> so, That's why so, you run this conference. <laughs> uh, I'm sure that it will generate, correct. I'm sure that you can, you know, we will generate a lot of uh, discussions, uh, questions. Yes, Peter. I have a question, um, just to poke the cobra a little bit. Um, I just want to ask both of you what you think about our requirements about smoking cigarettes and uh, smoking marijuana since the laws may change with that too. Where, where do we both stand on that? Yeah. I actually don't agree with our current policy about cigarettes. Um, so the question was, um, how do we both respectively feel about our policy regarding tobacco? Um, and for those of you that don't know, we require that patients be without cigarettes for six weeks prior to, the, prior to getting a liver transplant. And the same question goes for our policy about marijuana. We've actually recently changed it, and we now no longer, um, patients are allowed to smoke marijuana and get a transplant, is the bottom line. Um, and, and I don't have, quite as firm of a thought about marijuana. Um, I think many patients will end up needing it for you know, medical, medicinal reasons. Um, I am concerned about you know, potential infection risk. I think we need to see more longer term data. I do feel very strongly about the tobacco, and I think that we need to be requiring patients to be off of tobacco for a longer sustained period. And I really think we, we should be treating it very similar to alcohol. And because the, you know, one of the two most common risks of you know, death post-transplant is gonna be cardiovascular disease and cancer. And, and tobacco smoking is no doubt one of the strongest predictors of that outcome. Um, and alcohol and tobacco oftentimes go hand in hand. And when patients are relapsing, they're all oftentimes relapsing with both alcohol and tobacco. So I actually think I feel just as strongly about the alcohol argument as I do the tobacco argument. Oh, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead, no. The rule, it's very easy to apply the rule. And that's actually one of the virtues 
because the other way you have a lot of wiggle room and you have unconscious biases that will creep into things. And there are so many studies showing police officers, DAs, real estate agents have bias even by name of people. I think physicians have bias too. And we like people like ourselves. I have to argue for one of my patients who was so disheveled that he complained that his cups of coffee were spoiled by people dropping quarters in them and stuff. And he was a very educated guy. So uh, and we saw how it was gained before Mel. So can you speak to the, the biases that we don't have a clear cut rule in what's happening brain in terms of justice? Yeah. I can, oh, oh yeah, do you, go, go, go. just my opinion quickly. Um, I agree, but you know, everything we do is biased. I mean, every time we have a selection, there are people who are um, champions for that patient, there are people who are against it, you know, we're hearing snippets of, of workups. So I think, I think you're right, it's not a totally uh, uh, accurate and uh, balanced system, but it's the best we can do. And I think what I'm just trying to say is that, you know, having a, a clear cut hurdle like that is not necessarily the right thing in, in, in some cases. Mm -hmm. and does this work? And I don't think we're ever going, there is no single rule that's going to apply to everybody. But hopefully what I've convinced you of is that it's pretty compelling data when you get to at least a threshold around six months. And of course, the longer you're sober, the better. Um, but of course, you're going to end up losing a lot of patients who don't make it to transplants. And so similarly, kind of with the outcap argument is the the more you, you know, how much can we handle the large degree of evaluations that we would get if we start lowering that threshold? The floodgates are going to open. It's going to require a lot more effort on our part for evaluating to identify those few patients who really stopped drinking three months ago but otherwise have perfect other profiles, psychosocial profiles. Um, generally, they don't. General, and, and that's generally for patients who truly have alcoholic liver disease. So an abusive pattern of drinking that has led to them developing cirrhosis. Um, so I think it's a slippery slope. Um, and I agree, I have you know, met patients who have not met the six month mark. And when I see them, I'm like, this person is not gonna have a problem with drinking after transplant. Granted, I could be wrong, and a lot of us are. You know, we go in and we advocate for our patients, but the majority of patients, the shorter you get in that sobriety period, the less likely they are to have really other favorable psychosocial profiles that are gonna kind of predict a low risk of recidivism post-transplant. So we have to start somewhere, and it's kind of getting that balance of how many patients are we gonna lose on the transplant risk to what's a reasonable cutoff that actually has been shown in multiple studies to be associated with post-transplant recidivism. And I think that uh, both presenters really emphasize the need for us to have better ways to assess the risk of recidivism that is validated and reproducible. So it's very difficult to do that, but we're begging for data. So one last question. Yeah, I you know, wanted to make a comment uh, because I had some difficulty you know, with some of the argument of Dr. Fossil. Um, as an example, when he said that we are punishing prior behavior, I don't think that is necessarily the case. I think we are trying to, we are concerned about the future behavior of that person based on his past. I don't think that anybody has punishment in mind you know, when you approve or not approve, um, you know, transplant. But um, I wanted to also ask maybe both of them, you know, how do they feel about liver, you know, live donation in cases of acute alcoholic, you know, patients? Because in this case now, there is another factor involved, which is the risk to the donor, which we haven't put in the equation yet. So, you know, punished is a relative word, uh, and <laughs> you can really be punished, and you can be kind of punished. I, what I meant was that you just, you're not, you're not affording them the full chance that they deserve. That's what I mean. Um, as far as living donor liver transplant, uh, you know, one problem with that is, is that the patients are quite sick, and we generally try not to, we don't do that, we don't do live donor liver transplants given how more complex and more complications there are in sick patients. Um, I mean, that's it's something. I mean, we do that for other indications. You know, we do that for patients who are out of uh, Milan, uh, HCC, and so forth. So yeah, I, I mean, it's potentially an option. I mean, maybe not in the alcoholic hepatitis group, but maybe in the, uh, you know, decompensated cirrhotic group. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. So. Great. All right. Thank you, both of you.